Thank you for joining us on Sandbar Serenity today. Today we're going to talk about docks and I've got six tips that you don't want to miss if you're building a dock or things that you can do to improve your dock. And then also a bonus tip, which is very, very important. So stay tuned to the end to hear that bonus. Let's get started. Okay, so one of the most important aspects of your dock is the posts. These are the foundation that you're really supporting all of your weight on. My dock has six by six posts and they're driven six feet into the lake bed. Now six feet is really important. A lot of dock builders just do four, but if you have a muddy lake bottom uh, that can extend sometimes for several feet, you wanna make sure that you get past that and at least into some solid substrate. And getting down six feet will absolutely ensure that you get there in your lake bottom. And the reason why this is important is because all of the weight of the dock and the boat is being suspended by these posts. And so when you've got, let's say a 10,000 pound boat, like this Boston Whaler 280 Vantage, you're gonna run into trouble if you have all of that weight just on a couple of posts that are only four feet into the lake bottom. So what you wanna do is you wanna get these down six feet. And then when your boat is being suspended, it's gonna ensure that you don't get a lot of your dock basically you know, bending underneath the weight of this because they can support it. So all of my boat is supported on one, two, three, four, five, six posts. So that breaks the weight down into about 1500 pounds on each post. And then that means that there's six feet in the lake bed and there's plenty of depth to support the weight so that the top half, the, the, I'm sorry, the front of the uh, dock um, is not going to stay up firm and then the back half is going to start pushing down underneath uh, the weight of the the boat and the roof and all of the structure so really really critical to avoid um, having what happened to my neighbor's um, dock where he got a, a large boat 27 foot as you can see and he suspended it and <laughs> guess what happened um, after a little bit of time, probably about four to five months, I think it was, he started noticing that the posts where the stern of the boat was, were starting to sink down into the water. I mean, into the, uh, the lake bed, which was really unfortunate because once that happens, there's really nothing you can do about it other than just not put your boat, um, on the lift anymore. Um, so he all of a sudden found out that the um, uh, entry to the berth was sinking the back, you know, five or so feet was sinking, as you can see here in this video, and it was starting to buckle, which then caused problems with the roof line and all the other structures uh, that support the boat. So you absolutely want to make sure that your builder gets those posts down six feet. Um, here you can see I've got uh, all of these posts supporting the weight of the boat, and then I have my lift suspended on the top beams and not on the sides. And a lot of builders just, you know, take their lifts and they um, uh, put a little bracket on the side uh, beam and then rest the posts inside there. And I absolutely chose not to do that knowing the weight of my boat was gonna be a lot more. And you can see there, I've, I've had to center the, the lift up. I had a much narrower berth um, at the beginning and we'll talk about that in just a second. So uh, to wrap up this portion, um, I use six inch uh, by six by sixes and they're at least six feet into the lake bed, providing plenty of stability and strength um, for suspending the weight of the boat and the roof. All right, next I wanna talk about the width of your berth. So this is really, really key. Um, anytime you're trying to bring your boat in, most boats are eight and a half, nine feet wide and kind of a standard width uh, for most boat uh, house berths is 10 feet. Um, and that, for me, that was really, really problematic. And the reason why is because, yeah, I'm in a canal and it, it mostly blocks a lot of the waves um, coming off the lake. But a lot of times when that wind is blowing, I still get major currents ripping through here. And that can push the boat um, in uh, directions towards the shore or it can cause problems as um, I'm trying to come in. And if you have a really narrow uh, width on your berth, 
then that can be a problem. It's like trying to thread a needle. And that makes it very, very difficult um, to get in, especially on windy days with cross currents. So I originally had a 10 foot berth and I had a Sea Ray 290 SDX. And that boat was eight and a half feet, which gave me roughly a foot and a half width on each side. Well, that was okay to start with. It was still very difficult, but I had a joystick on the boat, so that made it a lot easier to manage. But then, um, I, as I got a larger boat, the Boston Whaler that you see now, now we moved up to a nine and a half width. And so then we only had six inches on each side. So that was a real problem trying to get in here. As you can imagine, six inches is only three inches of, of error room on each side of the boat. So that was not much uh, that we could deal with and we had to get it widened and we recently did that and you can see we had to move the lift um, which is what those um, unpainted segments are that you see across the top there where it was moved and centered up so we've just recently done that and i got to repaint it and get it touched up but now you can see i've got plenty of space plenty of room for error and more importantly time to correct um, if I've got a cross current coming in that's kind of pushing the boat in a certain direction um, and I need to adjust for that. So berth width, I would highly suggest um, whatever you know your width is, if you have a, a nine foot beam, get your uh, width at around 11, 11 and a half feet. So basically what I found is whatever the width of your boat is, add two feet. Uh, if not, if you can do a little bit more, then, then by all means do it. But just add two feet. Um, and that should give you, you know, what you need. Um, I actually did three, and I do not regret three. Three has been absolutely fantastic. And the reason why is because, yeah, there's a little bit of more space on this side over here. Um, but we don't board from that side. And the current's always kind of pushing the boat this way. So there's really only about a foot. Um, on this side and then we just simply pull the boat over and jump right on but when you're coming in wow that extra foot makes all the difference so we absolutely love it and i highly recommend um, just having a little bit of extra width on your berth it is really fantastic and we'll talk about this more in the bonus tip as well how that comes into play for the future very very important so stick around for the bonus tip on this one all right next let's talk about paint so um, I chose to paint mine. Most docks uh, that you'll find are just simply uh, natural wood uh, that the builder put up there. And you oftentimes don't really want to paint your dock for at least a year or more after it's constructed so that it has a chance to get all of the uh, moisture out of the wood. So you definitely want to wait before painting it. Um, I chose a, a beach house gray color which i think is just absolutely fantastic um, and it matches with the uh, flooring i chose as well which is a full composite so this has provided uh, a lot of beauty uh, to the dock it reflects the water just brilliantly um, at certain times of day in fact you can see it now so when you come in it almost has this cathedral type feeling to it, it it's really really neat and this is an oil base. Um, so I got this at Lowe's. It was their Valspar oil base uh, premium paint. And uh, it has just been fantastic. This paint is now going on seven years and it still looks absolutely wonderful. Um, make sure you get a, obviously a, a high end paint um, because marine environments are pretty brutal on just about anything, uh, paint included. But this oil base has just been absolutely wonderful. And as you can see, after seven years, it still looks pretty much brand new um, on the interior of the dock. Now, the exterior, yeah, I've got to do touch ups here and there. There's no question. Um, you know, you, you just have to do that. And then I also clean it about once a quarter. Um, come in, spray it, put some wet and forget on it, which, you know, helps with mold and, and other, you know, just junk that may um, get on there from just being in a marine environment. So. I do maintain the dock pretty regularly, but as you can see, after seven years, it, it really pays off um, as far as just having a beautiful space uh, to come sit and relax and, and take advantage of, you know, the cooler temperatures down on the water. And then also at night, because I live very close to Disney, just past those houses right there, 
um, there are fireworks in the evening from Disney that we can see. So coming and sitting on the dock and enjoying those fireworks has really been an amazing time and uh, added an extra dimension to the dock um, that I just hadn't thought about at the time that I built it, but it was really, really wonderful. So if you decide to paint your dock, um, I recommend it. It has been fantastic. It just elevates the presence of the dock and just makes it really, really beautiful and inviting to come into instead of just kind of looking like a wood structure. I mean, obviously you paint the interior of your house to make it look beautiful. Docks, you know, the same way. So I, I strongly recommend doing that. Get a, get a nice oil base. You don't have to put it on too thick because you don't really want to trap moisture in the post. You want to get that moisture out of there. So just a light covering and it'll uh, look beautiful for years to come. All right, as I mentioned before, my decking is a full composite. I got these planks um, at Lowe's hardware store and there is not a, a top um, slicker finished or vinyl layer on them like you get with maybe like a, a Trex um, deck. My neighbors have Trex and they have gashed uh, that Trex before, you know, bringing stuff down to their dock and it has caused some gashes in it. And so now they're um, underneath that, that vinyl layer, you actually see, you know, the composite. Well, I elected not to do that because of the concern about gashing things when you're moving stuff around, you know, on your boat um, or bringing it down, bringing down gas cans or, you know, any other equipment um, or just having kids for that matter. Um, so I went with a full composite board. There is no, um, there is no vinyl cover. So it is just the full composite board with a little bit of wood grain um, etched into it. And it's just absolutely fantastic. And again, I clean this probably every three or four months, just come out, give it a light pressure wash, spray some wet and forget on it. And I'm done, but it is absolutely wonderful. No complaints about this board whatsoever. Um, highly recommend getting something along these lines. Um, and then just, you know, getting on a regular main maintenance schedule, uh, just like you do with your boat and the rest of your house, pressure washing, cleaning, keeping things looking absolutely top notch is just absolutely critical for anything that's in a marine environment. So decking is really important. Um, try to look for sales if you can, um, get a color that you like, you know, lighter colors obviously are going to reflect the, the light and be a little bit cooler, uh, to walk on than some of the darker colors. Um, this is, uh, to match the paint, is a, a beach gray, so I liked all of that look. And then the contrast with the white chairs and other aspects to this, I think, are just, you know, fantastic, and they really came together well. So, you know, we come out and sit in the chairs and enjoy the evening on the dock and, and watch the fireworks. It's, it's awesome. All right, next thing I want to talk about are brackets. So I live in a high wind zone being in Florida. And most dock builders do not put additional brackets um, on your dock. They will if you, I guess, pay them a lot of extra money, but it's not really standard. And I've had two hurricanes roll right over me. Uh, literally the eye rolled right over me um, in the past four years. And so I said, hey, I want to do a little bit more. Um, we've got these on the house. Why wouldn't they be on the dock? Well, they work brilliantly. And so I put them on all of the uh, boards, the beams, and then as you can see up top, connecting the roof um, as well. So all the rafters are bracketed. And this really provides that extra layer of surety. Um, most docks are just held together with nails and you know some bolts in key places, uh, but your roof ultimately is just nailed together. And so when your dock is swaying back and forth or you've got a 10,000 pound pendulum or even a five or a 7,000 pound pendulum swinging back and forth uh, in your dock on your lift, what you really have um, is a lot of tension on those nails. And that causes, you know, from the movement that can cause things to come loose a little bit and then squeeze when you get, you know, other wind storms and other pressures on the dock. Um, then over time, those things can become very, very loose. So I went through and put brackets on all of my rafters, all the way down the dock, brought everything together and made it nice and tight to ensure that after many years, my dock is still going to be as tight as it was the day that it's built because nails always tend to work themselves out. Um, and so I added in 
the brackets that I was just showing you. And then also um, I added in these guys, storm drive connectors is what is holding them down. And all these are, are from Lowe's. Um, you can get them at Home Depot as well. But these are uh, Z-Max connectors. And there are several different varieties um, that work for different purposes, you know, as far as where you may be locating them, either on your house or on your dock. But these have provided me with that extra uh, surety that when another hurricane rolls right over us, um, the dock is gonna still be standing and it's going to be sound and secure and I don't have to go through and try to shore things up again, especially with, you know, 130 mile an hour winds. Those are really, really critical and have kept things nice and tight. This dock is a little over seven years old and it doesn't even creak. It is absolutely wonderful um, for, you know, enjoying having a bunch of people on, bringing the boat in. It's absolutely fantastic. So I highly, highly recommend um, taking actions like that, you don't have to do it as pervasive as I did, but definitely if you want your dock to be sound, I would recommend doing something like that. All right, uh, lastly, before we get to the bonus, let's talk about lifts. Um, my boat is a, a 10,000 pound boat, and so I got my lift to support 12,000 pounds, which means I have two one horsepower motors that lift it up nicely. Um, this is a gym remote system, and means I have a remote when I'm coming in or going out I can raise the boat uh, with a remote in hand and that is really really helpful so I have a cradle it's not a four post lift um, I have been contemplating doing a four post lift um, but uh, this seems to be working fine uh, for now and one important thing you know just to make sure is that when you get a lift um, always make sure that you are getting something with at least a couple thousand extra pounds capacity over the weight of your boat. So very, very critical to have that extra capacity. And if you think about it, it'll make sense from the perspective of the weight of the boat acting like a pendulum. So it's not just the downward weight of the boat that is pushing against that lift, but you also have to contemplate the side to side movement in winds. Um, that can cause that pendulum effect. And now you're not just pushing 10,000 pounds straight down, but you're pushing 10,000 pounds left, you know, and potentially right, especially in high winds, like in my area. Um, and just subtle movements of, you know, maybe half a foot or a foot can add extra uh, weight to the boat um, as it's moving from left to right um, in those high winds. So make sure you've got plenty of extra capacity and think about all the different gear that you're gonna leave on board you know, the dry weight of the boat versus the wet weight, um, you know, all those things start to add up um, and can cause issues as far as, you know, your lift. And as you saw from my neighbor's lift, you absolutely want to make sure that you suspend that lift properly. Um, and as you can see, I have done that uh, with a sandwich effect up here. So I've got uh, two by 12s sandwiched together um, there you go, you can see right in between there. And then being supported by the uh, beams and posts on the boat provides just phenomenal amount of uh, capacity to handle this. And then that is times three. So there's one, two, three, which uh, basically means that this dock is built like a tank. Um, and I wanna make sure I had that extra capacity for you know, any boat that I might get in the future. So that then brings us to our bonus section. So let's talk about the bonus. All right, so let's talk about our bonus here. And this is something that is absolutely critical and is honest to God's the truth. So as any boat owner will tell you, there is a disease, an infliction that comes with owning a boat. And it's called two-foot-itis. And this is very, very important to compensate for when you're building a dock or when you're contemplating what type of boat you're gonna get. We'll talk about that in another video. Um, how to buy a boat, what things you need to look out for, that sort of stuff. But two foot itis is very, very important, especially when you're spending a lot of money on your dock. What is two foot itis? Well, two foot itis, as I have experienced and as many other boat owners have experienced, 
is that infliction that comes upon you when you get in your boat and you go, wow, this is amazing. And then after about four or five months, you see another boat or you see something else and you go, oh man, if I just had two more feet, that would be perfect. My boat would be awesome. I could do this. I could do that. I could do a lot more with the boat. I could maybe go offshore a little bit more. I could go a little bit faster if I had twin engines. If, you know, if I only, if I only, if I only, right? Well, I've been a victim of that. So I started off with a 270 Sunray and then went from a 270 to a 290 uh, SDX uh, C-Ray. I said Sunray. Uh, a 270 uh, SDX uh, C-Ray. And then I went to a 290 SDX C-Ray. And then went to a Boston Whaler, uh, which is 29 feet as well. So I started off with a 27 foot boat and said, Hey, wow, this is awesome. Boy, you know, it'd be amazing to have twin engines. It'd be amazing to have a joystick. It'd be amazing to have these other things that are always that next level up in boats, which is about two feet. So that two foot itis of going from a 27 to a 29. Well, most 27 and under boats actually have a beam of about eight to eight and a half feet, which is fine for most docks. But if you build your dock thinking that you're never going to get a larger boat or never succumb to the infliction of two foot itis, you're probably wrong. So I've gone through three boats in the past four years and finally got to where I wanted to be with this Boston Whaler 280 Vantage. And if I had built this slip, which I did originally for a eight and a half foot beam boat, then this boat would not fit in there. And so I, you know, ran into issues with getting it in and the height of the dock um, up there, as you can see, it's pretty close. So you have to contemplate for things like uh, the level of the lake rising um, and making sure that you have plenty of clearance for a potential boat that has a bimini that you can lower. But in the future, you may buy a boat that has a hard top. And so you want to make sure that you can still get in your dock when you have a hard top and you can see i've only got about a foot and a half um, of coverage there so making sure that you have plenty of clearance making sure that you have plenty of width and yeah i've even with a you know a, a 29 foot boat I've, I've thought about buying a, a 32 foot boat so things like that are very very critical so make sure that you build your slip to the width that will help you get um, that next foot or uh, that next boat or contemplate that next boat so that you don't have to deconstruct your dock, which is very, very expensive. So build it right the first time, save yourself a lot of money, account for two foot itis, and it will save you a lot of time, money, effort, energy, and allow you to get the boat that you want instead of being limited out by your dock size. All right, well, that wraps up this session of Sandbar Serenity and talking about docks. I hope you found these tips helpful. And then also the bonus conversation about two foot itis. Make sure you take that into account anytime you're building a dock and what you may need to do in the future. Thank you. Please like and comment on this video. I reply to all the comments that our subscribers make. Look forward to seeing you in the future.